Last time, we covered the evolution of plants, animals, and even fungoid organisms in Domum Alpha's early history, and explored how some clades expanded from the oceans onto land. And because there's nothing I respect like my own hard work, it's now time to wipe them out. That's death. It's death to all of them. The world. Jokes aside though, I set the stage for a mass extinction at this point in the planet's history for a couple reasons. We'll cover those today, as well as details of the extinction and what happens in its wake. And I'll tell you about that seventh clade of terrestrial animals I was being so secretive about last time. That's suspicious. That's weird. The first reason it was time for a mass extinction was ecological and geological. It just made sense that these events would play out in this way at this time. The second reason was artistic. I finished moving creatures onto land and creating a dense rainforest ecosystem, and I hated it. It felt messy and unbalanced. There were resources being overexploited and others barely used at all. It felt too crowded, and certain clades felt especially unrealistic. For instance, two osteobrachid clades, orthomnodonts and orthokinigans, were large, tall omnivores and predators that lived on the ground but foraged and hunted in the trees. They were basically omnivorous and carnivorous versions of browsers, like evil giraffes or something. I think they felt unrealistic because many arboreal animals are small and agile, so their predators should have been as well, rather than these bizarre, gangly ground dwellers that were never designed for pursuit hunting. They just had to go. Clearly, something was not working. So, what did I do? Well, at risk of sounding like an overly philosophical villain, I only did the inevitable. At this point, some 280 million Earth years ago, Domum Alpha was in a greenhouse period. It had no polar ice caps, and the planet was hot and humid. This didn't last, though. Since terophytes came onto land 139 million years before this point, their photosynthesis had been sapping carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, cooling the planet. This accelerated as larger terophytes like Xylopratum and Archibretaceae evolved, but it then slowed as pteropods came onto land and started to eat them. Mm, very good. As more animals came onto land, atmospheric CO2 did level out again, but by this point, the global cooling couldn't be stopped. 260 million Earth years ago, there were only five high mountain ranges on Domum Alpha, but tectonic activity would inflate that number to 19 over the next 90 million Earth years. As the landscape grew more mountainous, the accumulating snow and glaciers made the planet's surface more reflective and less heat retentive. The globe cooled, and as water became ice, sea levels dropped and climates dried out. Let me add a little bit of ice to that. What's more, atmospheric oxygen had been plentiful before large animals came onto land, but as they grew more crowded, these levels fell. The abundant oxygen had allowed large populations and huge body sizes in animals that couldn't actively breathe in or out, so when oxygen levels dropped, armopods, neuroterozoans, and osteobrachids were the first to suffer. You've probably heard that if insects disappeared from Earth, ecological chaos would ensue. Now, not all armopods and neuroterozoans died out, but enough did that all the clades that used to eat them lost food. Combined with the receding rainforests, many herbivores and small omnivores starved. Predators naturally followed as their prey diminished. All the largest osteobrachids died out too, unable to absorb enough oxygen from the changing atmosphere. Of the 16 clades there had been before, only 5 would survive. Among the dead were the orthomnodonts and the original orthokinigans. <laughs> oh my god, it's not funny! <laughs> it didn't end there. The steady drop in atmospheric CO2 reduced phytoplankton activity, and their populations took another hit as Domum Alpha cooled down. This was compounded by changes in ocean circulation, and while most of the filter-feeding tilignaths would survive, three tilignath clades, including the two largest, would die out. In turn, this wiped out the ocean's largest predators, the xenomegalodons. 
no prizes for guessing what inspired them. In the end, this ice age and rainforest collapse sent 33 clades extinct. That's death. What the hell are we gonna do now? While many surviving animals adapted to the growing steppes, deserts, and tundra, the remaining osteobrachids were limited by their inefficient respiration. Some adapted by shrinking down, which helped their respiratory systems and primed them to fill the niches vacated by armopods and neuroterozoans. I only thought of these reptiforms very recently, so for now they're just a basic concept. Meanwhile, in the remnant rainforests, plenty of niches lie ready to be occupied by the seventh clade of animals to invade land on Domum Alpha. These animals, descended from aquatic ramosopods, are called xenotetrapods. Wait a damn minute! At this point, I should talk about convergent evolution, when organisms independently evolve similar traits. I mentioned last time that flowers have evolved in three separate plant clades on Domum Alpha. But I need to talk about convergence not just as an evolutionary phenomenon, but as an artistic tool. Fictional alien organisms can be expected, to a degree, to convergently evolve with creatures from Earth. For example, all of Earth's flying vertebrates have wings adapted from enlarged forelimbs that they flap to create lift and thrust, so why wouldn't something similar happen on another planet? There are also things like sea sponges and worms that are so simple it'd be a bit unbelievable if they weren't found on other planets. An alien world convergently evolving with Earth can be believable, relatable, and even interesting. Personally, I love how Domum Alpha has creatures resembling bivalves, cephalopods, and gastropods, but unlike Earth's mollusks, my clades are barely related at all. Same same but different, right? But I understand that someone might look at this world that I've worked so hard to make interesting, diverse, and believable, and wonder why I wanted tetrapods. I mean, I've replicated our evolution from ray-finned to lobe-finned fish to terrestrial tetrapods with very little divergence. I can't explain why I did this. Yet. Why? Why not? <laughs> why, though? For now, I'll just say that I think my xenotetrapods are believable, though they seem like a weird artistic choice. I'm also aware and unbothered that many xenotetrapod subclades are very similar to animals from Earth. After all, they're meant to be. There are frog-like egrodomes, lizard-like dendrozoans, crocodilian flumakinigans, and two clades comparable to dinosaurs, acamptochordates and terrakinigans. Xenotetrapods don't just thrive in the post-extinction rainforests, though. They've also spread to the savannas, and caused some minor chaos. A danger to society. Many animals on the savannas are adapted for speed, but even the fastest pteropods and pterognates can't compete with xenotetrapods because they just have too many legs. Cursorial animals benefit from long, slender legs and flexible backbones, which lengthen their strides. For a quadruped, this is no big deal, but animals with more legs can only get so long and flexible before their snaking bodies cost them agility. As xenotetrapods spread onto the savannas, they drive about 14 clades to extinction. Death. But we're getting into the realm of works in progress here, so that number might change. By the way, the last of the orthokinigans are some of those wiped out. Oh. All right. I wouldn't call this event a mass extinction in its own right, but I'm not sure if I'd call it a kind of second wave to the Ice Age and Rainforest Collapse. I guess it'll depend on exactly how many clades it wipes out. It's all death. Despite xenotetrapods gaining traction, one pteropod clade is able to thrive by adapting flight. Scanderopods were arboreal ambush predators that went extinct in the rainforest collapse, but they were survived by relatives that developed feathers and flaps of skin between their legs that allowed them to glide, and finally adapted muscles for powered flight. These atlasteridges diversified into all sorts of niches, and their flight speed helped them hold their own against xenotetrapods on the savannas, which terrestrial pteropods could not. However, Atlasteridges were only around for 30 million Earth years before competition came on the scene. 
I mentioned the acamptochordates, which resemble raptorial dinosaurs with their stiff tails and short forelegs. Early acamptochordates struggled because their eggs were apt to dry out on land, but one arboreal clade developed not just thicker eggshells, but also flight. These are gladiopterages, which were initially based on birds. Not having beaks though, and being covered in hair-like fibres rather than feathers, they look quite like pterosaurs. We'll call that a happy accident. Their hind legs also serve as auxiliary wings, and their wings evolved from enormous lateral claws, more like pterosaurs than birds. I decided to do something funky with Gladiopteridge's wings, based on the great Leonopteryx from the film Avatar. These creatures have a main wing surface, and a few additional surfaces clearly adapted from finger-like digits. However, if all these digits elongated at once, this would likely produce a bat-like wing, so I'd guess that these extra wing surfaces were once pterosaur-like claws that somehow became redundant and adapted to aid flight. These wings looked so interesting to me that I just had to mimic them. It was a cultural reset. It was a cultural reset. Even during the Ice Age, wetland ecosystems still thrive in the tropical rainforests. While many semi-aquatic animals have come onto land over the ages, some have instead readapted to marine life. I mentioned that Tilignaths suffered at the beginning of the Ice Age, and as a result, so did their predators. The marine ecosystems were destabilised enough to allow three clades, two of which were xenotetrapods, to return to the ocean. Pelagodonts and Thalatic Pilates are descended from semi-aquatic Terrakinigans and Flumakinigans respectively, while Thalatomordians are descended from semi-aquatic Pterognaths. These clades occupy similar niches in different regions, dominating as titanic filter feeders and apex predators. And despite being the second clade to return to the seas, Thalatomordians are the most diverse thanks to their endothermy, which gives them an edge over the others in cold polar seas. There's one more xenotetrapod clade that I may or may not have been leaving for last. Maliodermes are quite diverse, but they descend from small arboreal animals that adapted to bear live young because laying eggs in trees is risky business. To support this, the tiny scales of their lizard-like ancestors elongated into insulating fur, and they also adapted endothermy. Maleoderms are obviously based on mammals, but they don't lactate, and their fur being highly modified scales makes it more like the fuzz on moths than the hair on mammals. They're also ovoviviparous, which is a bit of an ill-defined term, but it generally means that an egg simply develops and hatches in the parent's body. However, most mammals are matrotrophic viviparous, where the embryo is nourished from the parent's bloodstream via the placenta. Again, it's same same but different. Lots of maleoderms resemble animals from Earth. There are xenophiliforms based on cats, aphratotheres based on rabbits, and piasmachirids based on primates. What? Alright, here's the wink at last. The whole reason I wanted maleoderms and xenotetrapods, even as far back as the ramosopods, was to create one species. One humanoid species. It's been no secret that the world of Babel would have animals with human-like intelligence, but I wanted these creatures to be specifically humanoid. I'll go into the reason for that next time, but for now I can at least explain some things I've glossed over. Firstly, Gnathostomes. I wanted animals with not just internal jaws, but internal jaws much like our own, so that when these humanoids developed languages, I would be able to pronounce them with minimal approximation. Secondly, the Coleoarthrodires. These are the aquatic ramosopods with flesh, skin, and scales covering the armor plating on their skulls. They're also ray-finned fish, which was important so that my humanoids would end up with fingers. More on that next time. Next were xenotetrapods. I don't see why humanoid intelligence couldn't evolve in marine animals, but their technology would be limited, so I wanted terrestrial tetrapods. I wanted tetrapods specifically because I worked with hexapods in a previous world, and I didn't want to mess around with the more limbs is more better idea again. 
Then malleoderms. The important thing I wanted with them was endothermy. It seemed natural that arboreal animals would have live young, which was the perfect incentive for malleoderms to develop insulating fur and then endothermy. And finally, piasma chirids. I heavily based their evolution on primates, because I wasn't very confident in my understanding of what allowed humans to evolve our intelligence, sociality, and tool usage. I felt it'd be most believable to take similar evolutionary steps, if you will, and the same number of them that we took to get from fairly ordinary arboreal mammals to quite unusual creatures like chimps and humans. More on Piasma Chirid evolution next time, but for now, have you met the Diplophagans?